Who's scared? Yeah, let me do that. Well, so um, it's a pleasure to have Professor Kai George Wieser as our speaker today. Um, Kai received his PhD in 1996 in Institut de Physique Théorique at Sewa Saclay, Paris. After a few years in Essen, Germany and UCSP Santa Barbara, he joined ENS Paris, where he is now a full research professor, a more accurately director de recherche at CNRS. Kai has made lasting contributions on field theories for statistical physics, logarithmic conformal field theories, disordered systems, functional renormalization group, just to name a few. He has published more than 100 research articles, including his most recent review article this year uh, in Progress in Physics about disordered elastic manifolds. Besides his academic success, Kai is an excellent painter and held exhibitions of his painting in Paris. I encourage you to see some of his paintings on his website. Well, today, Kai will tell us about his very recent work about what ants know about loop erase random walk and functional renormalization group. So over to you, Kai. Uh, thanks, Priti, for this very nice uh, uh, introduction. What I want to, to talk uh, about today is uh, a joint work with uh, Andrei Fedorenko, Mikhail Kompanietz, and Asaf Shapira on uh, well, the relation between several models, sand piles, loop arrays from the walks, the binning of charge density waves, and the ON model in the strange looking limit of n equals minus two. But let's start to look at the uh, random walk and uh, the loop arrays random walk. So here to the left, you will see a random walk. And uh, whenever it uh, comes back uh, onto itself, makes a loop, the loop is immediately erased. So the erasure, you, what remains after the erasure is uh, the, the blue part. And uh, in pink, you see the erased loops. Eventually, there could be pink loops underneath uh, uh, the, the blue part of uh, the curve, or uh, pink parts could be um, uh, several uh, times uh, visited. So the, the blue object here is called a loop arrest random walk. It's a fundamental object in, uh, in, in mathematics, and it has also some applications in physics even though I'm still looking for the perfect model. So one model you can uh, think of is uh, our end. So now we have had one end running in the search of uh, food. And uh, well, suppose it can tell its friends, I found something and then the friends will follow its uh, trace. And whenever they come to a, to a branching, uh, while well, they just follow the youngest trace, suppose that uh, the odor of the trace dissipates over all that time so that they can find the youngest piece of trace by the, by the strongest odor. And then they just follow the youngest uh, trace and they will just do this blue object here. Uh, so from a statistical physics uh, point of, uh, of view, I would like to know about the scaling so first of all, the example here has 500 steps. If I uh, look at the radius of gyration, RG, uh, it will scale with a number of steps to a power one half, well, because the, the object is simply a, a random walk. But I can also look at the scaling in terms of uh, the loop erased random walk here. So the blue part, sometimes also called the, the backbone, while well, I will find a different scaling and the, the scaling exponent, more precisely, it's an inverse, um, is the fractal dimension of loop erased random walks. So the fractal dimension of the random walk is the two, which is here. And the fractal dimension of loop erased random walk walks is this a z here. It is known, for instance, from stochastic Löwen evolution in two dimensions that this uh, exponent is five over four, <clears throat> while in, in three dimensions, uh, we are going to see a theory which calculates its fractal dimension. 
and uh, we will also see uh, simulations which uh, come to the same conclusion. So the fractal I mentioned in three dimensions is about 1.6 uh, to uh, 4. So this is loop erased random walks. Remember, I had many uh, models in my. Okay. Uh, so, what is the definition of radius of gyration? This is the average distance it travels in n steps. <clears throat> so, there are different ways you can define. They all have the same scaling. So, you can take the end to end distance. So, the distance between these two points uh, squared, take the average over many realizations. Uh, and um, well, then you will find this. Uh, um, this law here. You can also take uh, the, the sum of all pairwise distances squared while you will get to the same um, uh, to the same law. Maybe with a factor of, of length or so. Okay, thanks. It's the same definitions you loop in, you use in, in random walks, uh, sorry, in loop uh, self-avoiding walks. <clears throat> now, excuse me. Yes? Uh, this number 1.624, this is known only numerically? Yeah, so I will explain how I know it since, uh, since our work, it's also known analytically. I will explain. Thank you. Um, so I had several models on, on, my, on, my, uh, on my title. So one is, uh, um, well, the ON model. The ON model can be defined uh, either on the on the lattice or by uh, field theory. Uh, so excuse me. Uh, can I just quickly ask about the model's definition in terms of uh, erasures? What? How do you deal with backtracking? I understand you erase loops, but do you view backtracking as a degenerate loop? Yeah. So, I mean, I wanted a very nice um, the drawing here to the left. So, uh, you see. I, I don't go immediately back a step I have proposed. So this is excluded in the algorithm, which gives ni nicer pictures. I can also backtrack, then it's considered a loop. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let me come to the ON model. So in general, oops, uh, I lost my mouse. So. Um, here to the um, to the tops, you see um, well how to define the ON model on the on the lattice. So you take nearest neighbor uh, inter interactions between two spins phi. Phi are supposed to have a modulus one, but then uh, well they, they live on on the um, n-dimensional sphere. So this is an n the ON model. And uh, you write down the uh, partition function or e to the minus h over t subject to the constraint that this has modulus of one. These models have for all values of n, uh, actually you can even define them for non-integer n by going to uh, high, high temperature expansion, fortune castellan expansion. I mean, there are tricks to define this even for non-integer n. Um, they, for all n, they have a, a phase transition. So there's a critical temperature Tc. And uh, at this critical temperature, the model is scale invariant and even conformally invariant. So it can be treated by renormalization group uh, methods or exact solution, the conformal bootstrap. What I will use is uh, uh, the phi4 uh, theory. So it's a soft spin version of the model uh, written at uh, the top. So you have an n vector spin phi i, i goes from one to n, and you have uh, three terms in the interaction. So the first term is some elastic um, energy. Uh, the second, uh, well, the, the m square is effective uh, difference to Tc, and then you have a nonlinear term um, phi i square summed over all i uh, square, in wh which you have to treat in perturbation theory. So known values are, of course, the easing model for n equals 1, the xy model for n equals 2, the Heisenberg model for n equals 3. And you probably know also the self-avoiding polymer 
for n equals zero. Um, so let me make one remark on perturbation theory. Well, here I've written again the, the model. So the first two terms you can solve analytically. The last term has to be treated in perturbation theory. In perturbation theory, now I'm talking 5-4 theory, but the same combinatorics is valid on, on a lattice. So in 5-4 theory, I can, uh, so, so here the vertex is uh, represented by, uh, by this object with the four, uh, four, four legs each. Uh, so there are two legs with the same index phi i square and phi j square. So I can uh, contract in two different ways. Either I contract the phi i with the phi j. So this gives the uh, first uh, diagram here. Sorry, I lost my mouse. So I can't show this uh, uh, better. Uh, or you can check uh, the same uh, index and then you get the loop, meaning you get a factor of n. So the loop I've uh, drawn and read here. And the important thing to remember is it comes with this factor of n. So these are real fields. I can also have uh, complex fields. A complex, fields, a complex field has the two uh, real fields. And when I draw perturbation expansion, well, I give a direction uh, to the to, to the line. Now, high temperature expansion, which works for a fixed length of my um, um, of my walk, or or I mean both walk and and loops, and um, the five four theory, they work in different ensembles. So the the lattice expansion is usually done for a fixed length t. Uh, whereas the uh, five-four uh, theory is in there is in uh, in the ensemble of fixed chemical potential. And the relation is um, well, this uh, integral relation, also known as Laplace de Gen transformation. So you give a weight uh, e to the minus m squared t to a walk of length uh, t. And uh, the second term, which you see here, is e to the minus k squared t. So this is in Fourier, the diffusion propagator or the polymer propagator. So if I were to Laplace transform this, I just get this e to the minus x squared over t divided by t to the t or two of some uh, normalizations. <clears throat> and when I do the Laplace. Just to interrupt. So uh, if you are not finding your mouse, you can, in the Zoom window, there's an annotate option that you can use. Um, on the top of the zoom screen, there's a view options. Oh, you annotate see, here. Do you see annotate? There's a view options. There's options at the very top of your zoom screen. Uh, do you see that? No. Or you can go into your keynote, you go into the settings, and then there is the option there for mouse pointer. Okay, and then I have to. Just in the settings, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, there is a. Uh, I think in slideshow, maybe, uh, yeah. The show pointer, yeah, in the uh, below. So pointer when using mouse or track. Okay, okay, I found it. That should work now. Okay, good. Yeah, we see your mouse mouse pointer now. It is small, but we okay. Can... So let's see where we were. Oops. There should be laser pointer also. Okay, so. Um... Well, I think it's working like this. So um, I said, uh, so the two ensembles are related by Laplace de Gen transform. Uh, so now let's first review um, uh, self avoiding walks or self avoiding uh, polymers. Well, you have uh, this uh, polymer configuration with one uh, self intersection here. So the whole line is uh, thought of uh, being a polymer. And when you do perturbation theory, 
you get uh, uh, several configurations. So let's do this with the 5 4 theory. So, first of all, you get the free propagator, and then you get uh, this, this diagram where this is a drawing here uh, I, I use from, uh, uh, I mean, I use this uh, kind of uh, notation. Uh, for the polymer means that you have a self intersection uh, here. And uh, this comes with a negative sign. So if I choose the company constant G equals one, so these two um, uh, configurations just cancel, which means that uh, they don't appear in my partition function. And remind the self avoiding polymer, it's not allowed to self intersect. Um, but here is a second term. Uh, which appears in perturbation theory, namely the one with the loop. Well, in the polymer, the polymer you should think of as this blue line. You don't want the loops. So the trick is to put this n to zero. So that's a trick invented by Degen uh, to, to treat uh, uh, self avoiding uh, polymers. So that's the intuition in, uh, from 5 4 theory how to, how to treat uh, self avoiding uh, polymers. Well, here I treated one self intersection. So if you want to treat up to uh, K self intersections, then you have to go to order um, K in this expansion. So Kai, is it then you're saying that if you do the graphical expansion in the perturbation theory, then each graph would represent like a self avoiding polymers. Is that the connection? Yeah, so this is a self avoiding polymer, which is touching at this point. I mean, it's really doing this it's touching at um, well, in space at point Y. So this is uh, the drawing of the internal coordinate. And this means that in space, they're together. So usually when the phi theory is written as delta of this position minus this position of the polymer. And these are, uh, so I mean, this is just a way of drawing this. Except this is not a polymer configuration. But it would be a configuration of, uh, well, you can look, view it as a polymer configuration, but then this is a shorter polymer here and an additional loop. And when you want to describe a single polymer, not sitting in a loop of polymers, then you want to give this red loop chemical potential zero. So this chemical potential for the loop is this factor of N here. I see. So you could subtract those in a suitability so that those loops can contributions go away. Yeah, so I just put the chemical potential for the loop uh, to zero and uh, the, chem I mean, the, the the weight per loop is n. I see, and that's how you take n tends to zero limit. Okay. And then I take n to zero. I see, okay, thanks. So that's a trick invented by Degen in 7072. Uh, mm. It also works on the lattice. Uh, so I'm doing it here in the, in the, in the feed theory. I will show you for the loop arise from the box lattice version later. Okay. Okay, so my cancellation worked by fine tuning this parameter G, but that's not necessary in RG. RG, you can take any coupling here, it flows to a fixed point, and at the fixed point, you get universal de um, description. So you can relax this uh, condition here, for instance, you can put one half. Well, then this is not completely subtracted uh, in this example, but if you go to large scales, effectively it will still be uh, subtracted. So that the physics is independent of this, this fine tuning I had done here. Um, okay, so this is random walk. Um, oops. Now let's do the same for loop erased random walk. Oops. Uh, for looperized random walk, I have the same uh, configuration. Just the rule, what I want is different. I want to keep this blue part and I want to erase the red loop. So I start out again with the same prescription here. So I write the free theory part. I have the one loop diagram of this form here and I choose G equals one. So this is subtracted. But now I want to choose this n here. So this n is uh, for 
um, loops with a direction. So if I don't, don't put a, a direction in here, I would have an additional factor of two. So this n I put to minus one. Uh, what happens, well, if I put n to minus one, these two cancel or these two. Um, so first, if I put n to minus one, I mean, it's, it's clear that these two cancel. So the propagator I get back is the original propagator. So the probability to go from x to z is not changed. It was changed in the in the random walk, uh, sorry, in, in the self-warding polymer, but here for the looperized random walk, I don't want to change this because the propagator of the looperized random walk is the same propagator as of the random walk. Remember when I um, showed you the movie, I didn't change the trajectory of the random walk. I just colored it differently. So by having by putting n equals minus one here and having all the perturbative terms uh, cancel, while well, ensure that the random walk propagator comes out uh, as, as it should. But now I want to read it differently. I use this cancellation here. So what I end up with is a, a, a redrawing of my um, loop arise random walk. So from this uh, configuration, I see my simulation. I go to this diagrammatic representation and you see I used the color code, which is very suggestive. So I get exactly the same I started with, but I get it a colored version. Now the colored version is very good because I still have to achieve uh, one thing which goes beyond just uh, the, the propagator. Uh, which is actually given by the free uh, theory. Namely, I want to detect whether I'm inside the red loop or whether I'm, I'm inside the, the blue uh, backbone. And the operator which does this is this one here. So if you insert it, let's just look at the first part here. Let's suppose this is component number one. So if you insert this first term here, inside the uh, blue loop while it will just count the length of the, the blue uh, loop here. Well, each time the, the, the loop goes through a point, it's, it's counted. So this counts the length of the blue part. While this term here, insert in the blue part, will not give any um, contribution because I said, I want this to be coding, I mean, co component number one, and this is component number two. So it does not contribute. So let's do what it does inside the red loop. While inside the red loop, I still have the sum running over n. So these two terms will contribute equally. So they will cancel. So this operator vanishes when inserted into the red part of the loop. So I can distinguish between the blue part. So the, the loop arise random walk, the backbone, and uh, the red part. This is what I wanted to achieve. Uh, excuse me, uh, I had a question in the from the previous slide. So in your second component, you are uh, contracting uh, two variables uh, like uh, uh, at uh, one point, and your third component, you are contracting one from the blue with one from the red. So shouldn't there be like uh, two n many ways of doing it, and not uh, uh, n many uh, in the third component? Um, so, I mean, what this point means would be a phi one star and here would be a phi one. So if I insert this object here, I would contract this with the first from this one. And then this one, I would contract the, the interaction and so on. Yeah. that. And should, what I'm saying is, uh, like in the when you're uh, contacting the third component with the so one variable from the third component to the uh, like the blue part of the third component to the red, so there are like uh, two and many ways of uh, doing it, right? Because uh, if you look at the whole loop, uh, so, uh, All right, I will go to my. You see my my port? Yeah. So that's my vertex. Uh, 
Well, let me contract with an external field one. Hmm. And then I have this, uh, this operator O, so, okay, let's put any field here. Yeah. Um, and let's, for instance, contract like this. Ah, okay. So the whole loop will be in the same index, okay? Right, right, yeah, I got it. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. The same thing you can do on the lattice. Um, so, I mean, up to now I've shown you a heuristic, uh, well, you may call it proof or not mathematicians, but certainly never call it proof. For physicists, it might be considered a proof, but I mean, it, it's a very heuristic uh, argument. Um, we have found a proof, a proof works on any finite graph. And again, I mean, the proof is, is it's math and it goes over pages and pages. So I just want to motivate the way of doing this on a very simple example, namely um, uh, a graph which looks like this. So it has three vertices, A, B, and C. You can go from A to B. You can do a loop uh, starting at B and coming back to B, and then you can go also from B to C, and when you arrive at C, your, um, your walk stops, okay? There's a sink here. So you can either do this, you can do this and one loop, you can do this and two loops, or you can do this and three loops and so on. So you see, I mean, this object here is a geometric series, and it's, it's something which is not there in, in lattice expansion, because lattice expansions, they have a um, well, there's a finite weight per loop, but I can't do a loop several times. But there's a very nice trick you can apply. You can, you can apply to sum the series, you multiply it by this object, one minus the loop. Well, when you do this, I mean, the, you have a cancellation of uh, terms, and the only thing which remains is this object here. Now, this we can uh, uh, recognize as a fermion partition function. So the expectation value of everything you can do here, well, it's just this one loop and you see there is a minus one for the loop. And uh, we remember from our high energy classes when we have a fermionic loop, always comes with a factor of minus one. And what is this object here? Well, it's a fermion propagator from A to C and I can't uh, make a loop because, well, I have a, a quartic interaction here. I would need a quartic interaction, but you know, I mean, fermions, if I take two high powers of the field, uh, then it, uh, it vanishes. So the idea I've tried to give you on, on this very simple example can be generalized to an arbitrary graph. Um, while this is a formula, the relevant formula, uh, which you uh, have to write down what this is is that the probability for a loop erased random walk, if I multiply it with a partition function, I get the lattice um, um, propagator in both cases for fermions, or one family of fermions. Um, so, elements of the proof is that bubbles of non intersecting loops uh, uh, factorize. Well, let's not dwell on that. Um, but again, I've given you uh, the theory of one fermion. Well, one fermion is like this minus one uh, boson. Remember, boson, n bosons running around the loop gives a factor of n and n fermions gives minus n. So one fermion is like minus one uh, boson. So that's the minus one uh, complex the boson we had earlier. Um, but this is, again, not enough if I want to, 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 to see whether I'm in the backbone or the, whether I'm in the, in the loop. But I can promote this theory to a theory of two fermions plus one boson. So to the one boson, uh, to, sorry, to the one fermion I have, 
uh, and one fermion and one boson. So this additional one boson and one fermion, they cancel, so they don't change, for instance, my propagator, neither the partition function, but they make the theory richer. So now they allow me uh, to check uh, whether I'm in the in, in the, the blue part, this propagator line, or whether I'm in one of the loops. Uh, so after recognizing the, the combinatorial part, or I still can write down the, the, the action. So the action is constructed that I can only have one outgoing line from each vertex, which is represented by this uh, term here. So this generates a perturbation expansion for the lattice uh, uh, spin model. Uh, the action is of the lock, oops, the lock of this object here. Um, and when I expand, well, when I expand to leading order, I get two terms. I get one term which looks like this m square term of my field theory, and then I, I get the lattice Laplacian. Uh, when I go to second order, the dominant term is a quartic interaction like we have in, in uh, phi 4 theory. So this is uh, the, the proof, well, a sketch of the proof how I get uh, from the lattice expansion on any graph, again, to a phi 4 theory, phi 4 type theory uh, in, in the continuum. So I have two points of view. I can say either, well, I want the exact uh, lattice correlation functions, or then I have to take this full action here. So I can, with this action, calculate ex exactly the lattice correlation functions, so exactly the loop arise random walk uh, propagator, or I can take the point of view, well, I just want the asymptotic limit. I want scaling exponents and stuff like this. So I take the scaling limit, and then the only terms which remain and the scaling limits are these here, which are the scaling limit of phi four theory. And when I see, say phi four theory, I, um, well, in this case, I mean two uh, fermions and uh, one boson, but they sit in the same structure. I mean, it's the same action, just the two, two of the terms are um, fermions and uh, one is, uh, is a boson. So, the what I try to, uh, to 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 summarize here is you have actually many um, theories which uh, describe you a loop arise random walk. You can take one boson, just gives you the free propagator. It will describe you um, the propagator of the of, of the loop arise random walk, but it will not tell you anything about uh, its fractal dimension. You can take one fermion. Uh, or you can take this at n equals minus one. One fermion, well, since for one fermion you don't have, um, it's a non interacting theory because uh, when you look at the interaction, since these are fermions, they square to zero. So it immediately proves you that one fermion or the limit n equals n to minus one in the for four uh, theory uh, does not give any corrections to the propagator, well, which is what we expect, but it comes out of the field theory. Uh, but if I want to look at more complicated objects, I have to look at the richer uh, theory and I can define uh, these objects uh, here. So if you're working on uh, loop arrest random walks or B and sand piles, which are equivalent, I will discuss this on the next slide. What you often see is a one generation of complex fermions. Uh, what I've uh, argued for at length is that this is not enough to access all observables. So this is a small part of the theory of loop arise random walks or abelian sand piles, which is sitting um, inside a bigger theory, namely 5-4 theory at n equals minus two, or this theory with two complex fermions and one complex boson. And uh, for at the end of the talk, I will show you that it's sitting even inside a bigger theory, theory which is relevant for charge density waves. Um, yeah, so 
well, I should put this uh, to, to, to a test. We can do loop uh, expansions and we've been able to go up to six loops thanks to the help of uh, Michael Kompanjets. And what we get in two and three dimensions are these values uh, here. You see, uh, even in two dimensions, the value is pretty, ex ex uh, pretty, um, pretty precise even though the expansion parameter epsilon is two. In three dimensions, I expect much better agreement and the agreement is uh, actually pretty uh, spectacular. Well, not as good as the simulations by David Wilson, which gives me this value here with, uh, well, almost vanishing uh, uh, error bars. Okay, other questions to this part of the talk? Kai, I missed the part how you get from the field theory the dynamical exponent z. You... Yeah, so it, since I said it's this operator here or uh, this one here, it's all different ways of writing the same object. So this object to ask me whether um, the loop arrest random walk goes through, I mean, whether I'm in the blue part or the red part. So it's a scaling dimension of this object which gives me the fractal dimension. And this is an object I can calculate the scaling dimension with standard standard 5-4 theory. I see, okay. It's a tensor operator. It's not one of the operators we, we usually look at. Usually we just look at phi i square sum over all i, and the, the, the scalar. The scalar is associated to the mass. But you also have the tensor operator, and the tensor operator gives you the the, the backbone. I mean, the propagator line here in, in in this drawing. Okay, and these results are not in a perturbation in expansion, but rather exact. So this is perturbation expansion in uh, in, in the field theory six loop order. Okay, this is exact. You can compare. And this is a really incredible numerical simulation, one of the most incredible, incredible numerical simulations I've ever seen. Uh, well, it's, it's not exact, but uh, there is no exact result in, two, in, in three dimensions. Okay. But uh, it's, the agreement, I think, is pretty, pretty good. Okay. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? So, Yes, the, the six loop calculation, uh, etc. This is done using the framework of uh, two fermions and one boson, is it? Or uh, no, I think it's done in the O n uh, model. I'm putting at the end n equals uh, minus two. Okay. Is, so the real. How, how is it actually done? Yeah. So you, when you do perturbation theory in the O n model, the n is a free parameter. Well, it comes always you see a loop like this. When you see a loop like this, it counts a factor of n. Okay, I see. So you do everything for arbitrary n. I mean, I did part of the calculations, uh, but uh, in five loop order, I still did the calculation myself. But in six loop order, I mean, I asked Mikhail Kompanjets, who has done this for the ON model. I told him, look, I want to know what you get for n equals minus two because this is interesting. But he had already done the whole work because he has worked for arbitrary n. Okay, I get it. Yeah, okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I mean, usually you use n equals one for easing, but people have already used the strange limit n equals zero, which is also only defined by analytic continuation for the self avoiding polymers. Now I just say, well, I, I put n equals minus two and um, I use it like this. So actually it's something uh, more, more general than, I mean, it's not restricted. My curve detecting operator here, it's not, restrict, not restricted to uh, um, self-avoiding, uh, sorry, to loop arise random walks. Of course it works also for self-avoiding polymers but it was also works for the ON model. So the ON model, if you make it, while well, you, if you, if you write down the high temperature expansion, 
Um, you can also distinguish between the backbone, I mean, the, the propagator line, the line which goes from the beginning point uh, to the end point. Well, this line here. And then you have uh, the whole thing sitting in a, in a soup of loops. And this is as well in the high temperature expansion as in uh, lattice simulation, you can distinguish. Mm -hmm. So you can compare uh, field theory here um, at six loop order and two different resummation schemes with the numerical simulations. Well, the first line we have already discussed, but you see it works for all of them. Luberized from the walk, uh, sorry, self avoiding walks. Well, this had been done before, but the easing model and the XY model, this had not been compared before. And uh, also this, uh, this works. Okay. Um, so what I've been talking about um, up to now is uh, uh, looperized, looperized random walks and how it's um, related to, to uh, well, spin systems uh, on, on the lattice or 5-4 theory. Um, but you see here a much bigger or much larger diagram. Um, so loop arrays random walks are also equivalent to Laplacian walks, Eulerian circuits, uniform spanning trees, abelian and fire models. Um, the POTS model. So I don't know whether Deepak Dar is still there. This D stands for for Dar here, it was Majumdar and Dar, and this was Majumdar. Um, so these, these relations here, they are very well established because they are exact uh, uh, relations. Then there was a, there are a rather daring a conjecture by Narayan and Middleton that the Abelian sent by model, they are actually equivalent to charge density waves. Um, well, something we we tested uh, with the, the field theory. So while well, there is a field theory for charge density waves, which I will try to sketch in the remainder of the talk, uh, by something which is called functional RG. And uh, then I will want will show you that this fixed point can actually be mapped back to fermions to this theory of two fermions and one uh, uh, boson. Um, to be able to discuss this, I have uh, to make some detour again on uh, disordered systems. So here you see disordered systems, which is disordered system, which is uh, actually it's a plate with some disorder on it, and it's pushed into a liquid, and it's filled from the side. So when it seems to be drifting down here, it's actually not drifting down; it's pinned on the plate, but pl plate plate is uh, moving down and you look from the side, but then you see avalanches. So this, you see this sudden, sudden movements here. Well, this kind of systems can be described by um, free ingredients and in elastic energy, which is a little peculiar for, uh, for the contact line. But uh, for instance, for a domain wall, you would just write gradient u square. Then you have a confining potential, which is formerly this mess um, term here in, 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 in like in 5-4 theory. And then you have a disorder V, which lives somewhere here uh, on, the, um, on, on, the, on, the, on the plane. So it's, it's, a, it's a function of x and u of x huh, on the position here. And it's described by some microscopic correlations, which I assume to be Gaussian, short range correlated in X. And I want to keep arbitrary function in, in, the, uh, in the U direction. Why do I do this? Well, because when I use one of the procedures to treat disorder, here it's written down for replicas, this function R, so this correlation function here, <laughs> undergo an RG equation, which I have written down here. 
Now, usually our G equation is for a coupling constant, no? for a number. So you would have just a number G here, and here you would have a G square. Uh, disordered systems need a more complicated or more evolved uh, RG, which is functional RG. So you write down again a flow equation, in this case for the disorder correlator, but it takes functional form. So here you have, for instance, the second derivative of this function square. What it does with your um, correlator is you suppose this object is smooth in the beginning, while well, we usually like to put smooth. Uh, microscopic models and you run this RG for a certain time, then at a specific point, so when you reach a specific scale, which is set by this parameter M here, uh, the function will develop a cusp. After you reach the cusp, the RG is no longer, you have, you. that's a point in, in physics when you uh, when you reach a multiple, when you find multiple minima, and uh, you will see avalanches. So avalanches is um, the observation here, but most of the time this moves smoothly, but all of a sudden you have these uh, gigantic jumps. Um, the system has been, people have tried to treat it via supersymmetry uh, techniques. In the supersymmetry uh, technique from this full uh, disorder uh, correlation function, in general, only the, the, the second derivative at zero, so the force force correlation at coinciding points uh, remains, and you get to some um, to something which is called dimensional reduction, which is a prediction for the roughness exponent, which does not agree at all with. Um, uh, functional, uh, so with, uh, with, with the experiments. Um, the, the reason why this doesn't work is because this uh, framework has been used for a single copy of the system. If you go to, to, uh, to two physical copies of the system, while well, this function R in all its glory reappears and you will recuperate uh, the, the renormalization of this function, and by this, uh, you will overcome this uh, seemingly uh, contradictory uh, prediction of dimensional reduction. Well, this was very short, but then there's a lot of research which has gone on. Um, <clears throat> so, Kai, what, when you say two copies, do you mean that you are doing some kind of quench averaging for the partition function? Is that the way? Yeah, so I, I studied French leverage and I put really two physical copies of my system. And then I do whatever I need to do to do the disorder average. So I have two physical copies. I can still have total number of copies zero. That would be the replica trick. I can supersymmetry to uh, get cancellation of the denominator, or I can use a formalism which is known as Martin C. Jarros. Uh, to, to, to average over disorder. Okay. All of them give the same answer. I see. So one more thing I didn't understand that when you say there are avalanches, they are something in dynamics, right? But here you would, it seems, I don't see where is the dynamics coming into the field theory? Yeah, so you have avalanches and the dynamics. A priori, it's a real dynamical feature, but you can also ask the question, well, I, I mean, I have this control parameter here. I've written again the energy, so let's stare at this. So this is a control parameter. And as a function of this control parameter, the center of mass of the interface will um, take a certain position. So either I increase this, then it's the pinning, or okay. I choose this to specific value. I, 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 I and then I do the minimization problem. The fixed point is at zero temperature. So I look for the lowest lying energy configuration. It will set, have a certain position, uh, center of mass position U, which depends on W. Then I choose another W and I get another center of mass position. 
And you will see the same uh, phenomenology. So I can vary this W each time doing this full minimization. And most of the time, it will be a very tiny, smooth uh, deformation. But sometimes I move W a tiny little bit and I get a big uh, answer of my system. And this see. is usually called shocks. It's equivalent to shocks in Burr's equation. Um, you can call it avalanches shocks. The phenomenology is very much the same as in asset depending. The question, of course, is a different it's minimum energy configuration to a last stable configuration at uh, the beginning. I see. Okay. Thank you. So Thanks. I can do this also for charge density waves. Um, charge density waves. I mean, charge density waves are are instability of a semiconductor devices to a periodic charge modulation, or well, it's strictly periodic in absence of disorder but if you have disorder this period is mod modulated again and i can describe this again by the same model so u would be a deviation of uh, the the period i mean of, of my my phase variable from the the unperturbed uh, uh, system of course this disorder now is periodic it's periodic in u because if i increase u by, um, by by the period, then I have to come back uh, to the same uh, disorder. It's, it's a phase. Huh? So the period in my example here, I choose to be uh, one, but I can use the same formalism, uh, functional RG for this object. I get the functional RG equation here. Uh, it's a copy of the equation I've written earlier, except that I've now written it for the force force Correlator, yeah, so the so this object here, and not for the potential itself. <clears throat> and now you can convince yourself that this has a very simple fixed point, which is a polynomial of order two. While well, we see this, if I insert a polynomial of order two here um, or here, out comes again a polynomial of order two. So first I get a polynomial of order four, but then I have two derivatives. So I'm back at the polynomial, polynomial of order two. And the only polynomial of order two, which is, um, which is periodic is, is this one here. So it's a parabola, parabola um, well, the one which I've drawn here is this one here in red, but then it's prolonged analytically. So the, um, the fixed point I've written here is just for this part here. And since we talked about avalanches, actually the slope at the cusp, um, I can explain this in private after the, the seminar, is related to avalanche size moment. So, the, so this ratio here of uh, avalanche size moment. Okay, so I have this um, periodic fixed point. Now let's insert this fixed point in, uh, in our RG. Um, so what I've written down here is the Martin Sitcher-Rose formulation. Um, it's almost the same as the supersymmetric formulation just for the bosonic fields. So if I were to use supersymmetry, I would have two, the two physical copies, which are now labeled T and T prime. So there are two auxiliary fields and then I have the disorder correlator, uh, which is a function of the difference between the two copies. Because, uh, well, since the whole system is translation and invariant, uh, the only thing which can appear, which couples to the disorder, is, uh, um, is the distance here. So here now you are introducing time into it. So it's so. Yeah, so this, not, is a, yeah. this is a Martin Sitcher-Rose formulation. Um, down here, I've written the supersymmetric uh, formulation. Um, I've written this down because it's it's just simpler. Um, so it's the same fields as you have in the supersymmetric formulation. So let's go to the supersymmetric formulation. Um, the supersymmetric formulation, I have uh, again two bosonic fields, and I do a small change of variables. So I go to the difference between the two um, copies, which I call phi. 
and to the center of mass. And what I get is, is the following here. So the difference um, appears here. So let's forget uh, that there is also the linear term. It, it doesn't couple back on our G. So let's just keep, keep the quadratic term. So if I take the quadratic term here, I will have the term phi square, I mean phi uh, squared. So that's the term you see here, just the square here and this phi square. It comes with two uh, auxiliary fields, which become after my change of variables the phi square uh, terms here. Um, and then you see fermionic field. So if I if I do this in, in supersymmetry, I also have to take care of, of fermionic fields. And we could go through the whole calculation, but it will take me a little bit too much time. So I ask you to believe that the fermionic fields, well, they combine with the bosonic fields in this way. Um, the important thing to, to realize is that the center of mass is not uh, coupling. So the center of mass is just sitting here in, uh, in the free theory part, but it's not sitting in the interacting part. So this is, uh, so these are the terms which, um, well, there's no U square center of mass um, of the two physical copies uh, term here. <clears throat> so the, the center of mass decouples from the whole, um, uh, from the whole thing. So what I remain with is a theory in the supersymmetric formulation, which has one boson. So the difference between the two copies and the two fermions, which um, this only a uh, careful calculation can show, combine again to the multiplet which we are used to from for, from uh, phi four theory. So this is my proof. Well, I'm sorry, it's a bit sketchy. The sketch of my proof, how uh, the, the disordered system, the, the charge density wave um, at the pinning maps onto uh, phi four theory with two fermions and uh, one uh, uh, boson. Um, you have questions on this part, or because I think I've mostly finished. Uh, I will skip the part on Senna mana sand piles, which also map on to functional RG. Um, and just put up my uh, conclusions. Um, so what I have shown is equivalence between the ON model at n equals minus two, Luber rest random walks, um, charge density waves at the pinning, and uh, the abelian uh, sent by model. While well, this, um, this to Luber rest random walk, this is. Um, this is not my, my work. Um, it's work by Majunda, Deepak Dar, uh, Lawler. Um, and I'm sure there is more interesting physics uh, hiding here. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and be happy to uh, take uh, questions. Okay, thanks, Kai. Uh, so yeah, we have time for questions. If... So, yeah, I have a question. So can you just unmute and ask? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I have a question for Professor Visa, and this is regarding the uh, cusp behavior of renormalized disordered pluralities, which yes. you showed, and it seems to appear across many types of systems. My question is this, is it possible to obtain this cusp for conserved direct per collision for, from a renormalization group solution of the large rank equation to those processes? Well, you uh, asked a very interesting question, which I had to skip. Um, the answer is yes. So um, when you go from the Senna mana sand pile, um, to, um, so there is an equivalence from the mana sent pile to depending of disordered elastic manifolds. This equivalence has two steps. 
The first is a mapping from Mena Central to CDP equation, um, which you do uh, by first looking at uh, the rate equations for uh, in the mean field limit. Um, and then adding, so, well, these are the exact rate equations. You will then uh, boil them down to rate equations for free fields, the empty sites, activity, and uh, the number of drains. Um, activity is slightly modified from what is usually used in order to have an exact relation. So in order to see uh, more clearly that you have only two independent variables, the two independent variables are activity and number of grains. So the blue terms here come from the mean field solution, the rate equations. And then when you have activity, you have a diffusive current, which is equivalently present for the um, density I mean, for, the, for the number of, uh, of grains. And then you acquire shot noise because when you have activity, while well, you you have fluctuations which are proportional to, which have a, a noise, which have a variance which is proportional to the to the activity itself. So when you take these equations, um, which I again written here, which are the standard CDP equations, you can actually do a very clever variable transformation. Um, you go to forces, well. Okay, you, to go, you go to a variable which you call forces, but which also turn out to be a variable you have already introduced earlier, which, is a, uh, which are the empty sites, then, and which is related to um, rho minus n. So the important um, observation is if you take rho minus n, the equation, uh, since it's Laplacian with the same uh, prefactor here, uh, so the equation becomes local, so the equation for this combination, which I call force, is local. And then the equation for rho, which I call u dot, has this form here. Yes. Now this equation here, um, you can also write it as a function. Instead of writing dtf, you can write duf. And then you get minus fu plus the white noise. So. In terms of the variable u, uh, it's a uh, um, einstein uhlenbeck process, which at short yes, scales yes, yes. is like a random walk, but at large scales, it it uh, it's uh, it um, it saturates. So f on large scales, so f is short range rough large scale uncorrelated object. Well, we call it a force. And here you see, if I integrate once, I get an equation of motion for u, which is which I identify as a, a position of my interface. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have Laplace minus m square u. So it's just a standard equation of motion for an interface. And after integration, this is just the force. Did I answer your okay. question? Merci, Professor Wiese. Yes, you have answered my question very well indeed. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, can I ask a question about the ON model once more? Uh, so, the, uh, so you are doing an epsilon expansion yes. of the ON model. And uh, so when you say that you, so you are looking at like epsilon to the power six uh, order term, is that right? I mean, it's the, and what's that six loop? It's, is it like the um, epsilon to the power six? Yeah, so I mean, it turns out that uh, loops is equivalent to expansion in epsilon. The reason is that uh, the fixed point is order epsilon, which yeah. means that G coupling constant is order epsilon. And, right. uh, loops give factors one over epsilon at, at the most. So right. that's why this is equivalent in the system. Now the, <clears throat> so, uh, so you're putting uh, for D equal to three, you put epsilon equal to one. And for D equal to two, you put epsilon equal to two. 
exactly. then your uh, the coefficients of your uh, epsilon expansion uh, sort of uh, have to be controlled in a way that if, uh, you know you can put epsilon equal to two uh, at some high order of epsilon and still get reasonable answer. So this plus minus like 0 0.01 uh, where, yeah, so uh, I, what I'm saying is that, you know, normally if you do, do large n or something, then uh, there is another control, namely that you can uh, go to some high order in epsilon and then there is another control which is large n. Now n is equal to minus two. So where is the control in those, I mean, the coefficients of course, will be function or uh, will be a function of n and you put n equal to minus two. So I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, you can put epsilon equal to two. I mean, it just. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, I mean, that's a real piece of work to, to even having the expansion to get to going here. So the uh, epsilon expansion is a, a diverging series, but it's borrow uh, summable. Uh, so what you do, you do uh, the Borel transform, and then you try to uh, well to get some analytic continuation, and then you do the inverse Borel transform. We have been working with Mikhail Kompanyets and he already before on different schemes um, uh, to uh, to do this epsilon uh, expansion, and uh, in the schemes you can still vary some parameters. Mm -hmm. And uh, which gives you a well, while, and then you 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 compare what you what you get in the different schemes, and if they disagree, well, then you put bigger error bars. This is essentially what has yeah, been done. I mean, here, for instance, um, uh, this is the Companiets Panzer scheme from 2017. Mm -hmm. he, he puts a little bit larger error bars than this is my invention, the self-consistent uh, screen. Uh, self-consistent uh, expansion. Well, I might have been just um, be lucky because I get so close to the um, to the simulation results that I was confident about my error bars. But mm -hmm. probably his error bars are uh, more more reasonable. I see. And okay. uh, of course, I mean the the checks to large n. So we take our six loop uh, results. We even now have seven loop. Yeah. Um, so we take the six loop results and we take the large n expansion and then we compare it to the best known last large n expansion. I think it's crazy in this order one over n to the cube. Um, so we check that this uh, agrees. I see. But okay, I mean, wow. it's already checks, okay. This is amazing. This is quite impressive. Thank you. You're welcome. I I wanted to ask a question. Uh, so you know, for the sand pile model in two D, some exponents are still not known, like the avalanche size exponent. So can you predict that also from your calculation? Um. Yeah. So avalanche size should be two minus two over d should be one. But it, it's, it comes from scaling from the roughness exponent and... Um, Is that consistent with the known numerical estimates? Um, well, I mean, for... I forgot to, um, to check on the... I mean, I don't know the number which comes out in the literature for the avalanche size exponent of... Uh, 1.2 or some such thing, but not one. You know, but okay, it, it's not known to be correct, and there might be log corrections and all those kinds of stuff. So one doesn't know the answer, but I was just asking if in your approach it gives you some more reasonable number. Yes, yeah, so, I mean in general there is a scaling relation. Um, okay. So okay, okay. I mean, let me show this one. So there are scaling relations uh, for the avalanche size exponents which are robust, so um, we call it tor. So it's P of S proportion S to the minus tor and it's tor equals two minus two over D plus zeta. 
Mm -hmm. um, and theta for a charge density wave, uh, theta is zero. So I would naively see, say it's one, but for charge density waves, it's uh, actually a little bit more tricky because um, um, charge density waves, if you drive them, you have an additional locking like contribution. So you get actually to a roughness exponent, which is four minus D uh, over two. Um, and I don't know whether I'm allowed to use this. So I would get um, one here. Well, I'm allowed to use this and I would get two minus two or uh, three. Um, so which is four over three, but I'm don't, I, I don't know when I'm allowed to use the scaling relation here. So charge density waves are a little bit tricky. Um, But you know, in the same file problem, there is this relation to con log, conform log conformal field theory. And so one can expect additional log powers and you know, so then scaling analysis is a bit trickier. Yeah, so, I mean, I've tried to look into log CFT. Mm -hmm. um, what's written in the literature. So usually I see theories which have, uh, I mean, they call it symplectic fermion. So it's, it's two, uh, well, it's one family of fermions, which mm. I also had, um, but I mean, I'd argued here. Um, you still see my screen here. I had argued uh, here that uh, this, this is just not enough to do. I mean, it, it describes correctly the theory, but only a very small subsector not the sex subsector, which is the most interesting one. So when you enlarge the theory to the ON model, mm. um, you get additional operators. And for the rank two tensors, I mean, the rank two tensors are these this kind of objects. Mm. So there are two rank two tensors is the scalar and this tensor operator. Mm. Uh, they have different, um, different scaling dimensions at n equals minus two. But there's actually um, um, well, you showed this now. I mean, this um, the Abelian sent by model mapped on the, to the Potts model. Mm -hmm. There's also field theory for the Potts model. Mm -hmm. um, so there, I mean, it was developed by uh, uh, Amit and uh, by uh, um, Zia and Wallace. Uh, so. There's some debate whether one should do uh, um, perturbation expansion around six dimensions or around four dimensions. Um, my current belief is, but I can be wrong, that you should do the perturbation expansion around four dimensions for the I mean, for the abelian senpai model, um, and then you get a theory which has one more rank two um, um, object, which is a vector. And it turns out this vector is mixing with a tensor uh, at n equals minus two. And when you have this, you get additional logarithmic co configurations, uh, sorry, corrections. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess I don't see any more questions. So maybe let's thank uh, Kai again, uh, by maybe unmuting our mic and clapping. And thanks Kai, uh, very nice talk. So thanks for the invitation, it was a pleasure to talk to you.